evening everyone i hope that you are doing well and um it is once again thursday night i know that we had to take a week off last week because my son had a concert and i needed to be there for him but uh here we are back together again and looking forward to another bible study um as always i have some preliminaries to run through uh first of all use the comments section to sign in and say hello so that uh, those that are watching uh, might be blessed by knowing who they're watching with. Uh, if you're too shy to do that, feel free to hit the like button and, uh, or maybe if you really like it, the love button. And uh, uh, meanwhile, why a couple of things to keep in mind during the Bible study, and that is one that you can share this on your Facebook and perhaps other people might be able to take advantage of this and uh, maybe they'll you know gain some knowledge of the scriptures that they're in need of i trust that you're finding these bible studies helpful and uh, and not only helpful but honest and true to the scripture um, the other thing is that if you have a question feel free to comment in the comment section i'll see the question and uh, then i will respond to the question that you have and um, another thing is that if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, which we repost this on YouTube uh, after we're done here, um, if you're watching on YouTube, please uh, like and subscribe if you haven't already liked and subscribed. That helps to get our uh, videos, our, our teaching videos, uh, a little bit more visual uh, with regards to the YouTube community. They, they will... Uh, tend to make it more readily available to other people uh, if they see that there are people that are interested in this material. Um, all of that said and done, I think I covered everything. Uh, if you missed it because you're signing in a little bit late, you can always go back and, and uh, do it. And if you've been to the Bible studies a few times already, you probably know those preliminaries. So we're going to go ahead and have a word of prayer. Uh, we are on uh, the uh, Bible study guide that starts out with Matthew 20 there at the top. And we're down here to question number three. I think we touched on it last time, but I want to touch on a little more of it again this particular time. So um, let's bow our heads together for a word of prayer. Our merciful Father, may your hand be upon us. Remember, Lord, that we are but flesh and blood. We are created beings. It's too wonderful a thing, Lord, for us to expect that we might understand the gospel and we might understand holiness and that we might understand those things, Lord, which are in the mind of our creator. Uh, no, Lord, only if you reveal it to our hearts, only if the spirit that you have given to dwell within us, Lord, should respond in kind and translate it into words, Lord, and thoughts and understandings, Lord, that are on our level. Please help us because we must escape, Lord, from the corruption of this world. If, in, if only, Lord, for this hour of study, help us, Lord, to escape. I pray, Father, for sanctuary for our souls, sanctuary for our minds. I pray, Father, for our many brothers and sisters that uh, tune in and watch this, some from across the American continent, and uh, now, Lord, uh, others also that are in the international uh, realm. And I pray, God, your hand on all of us, that, Lord, we might grow and develop as Christians. And I pray, Father, that you would draw us together as brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord, that your hand would be on us to protect us from wickedness, both without and within. In Jesus' name, Lord, we ask. Amen. Okay. Well, uh, just real quick, I just want to acknowledge Daryl signing in. And um, uh, I beg your your, your uh, pardon, brother, if I can't quite, uh, but I think it's Kasiri uh, Joseph, and uh, he's one of our friends from Uganda. It's good to see you. Um, uh, anyway, uh, and... Uh, that's very, very kind. Okay, so that's who signed in so far. Obviously, if you're tuning in now, uh, we encourage you to sign in as well. Uh, but Kasiri, Joseph, Daryl, uh, good to see you guys. Um, let's go ahead and get started with the study. 
Uh, we are in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 28. Matthew chapter 20 and verses 20 through 28. I just have to turn there real quick. Okay. Then came him, came to him the mother of Zebedee's children uh, with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may uh, sit, one at thy right hand, the other at thy left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, uh, ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to think or to drink of the cup that I should drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand or on my left is not mine to give, uh, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were filled with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called unto them and said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whatsoever will be great among you, whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever would be chief among you, let him be your servant. Uh, even as the Son of Man came not to to be ministered unto, but to minister uh, and to give himself as a ransom for many. Okay, so um, as we're taking a look at these passages, a couple of things that we're seeing. First of all, we're seeing that the concern of the disciples at this time, the apostles, uh, is focused on the coming kingdom. Remember that where we are in the scripture is the earlier part of the final events of Jesus's time on this earth. And uh, so as they are approaching uh, the time of the crucifixion, the apostles are not really understanding what that means. They just know they're getting ready to head up to Jerusalem. And uh, to them, uh, that is some kind of a sign or some kind of a sign or an indication that the kingdom is about to come. Now, that being said, why um, we, need to, um, we need to step back a little bit to contextualize the conversation. Okay, the conversation is in the context of the kingdom. Now, uh, and I said this last time, last couple of weeks ago, but I'm just gonna refresh everybody real quick. Uh, in, in the old times, and perhaps maybe even today, if there are still some kingdoms left that uh, actually are not just figurehead monarchies, but are actual monarchies, um, the king would sit in the middle throne, the big throne in the middle. And to his right would be the one that would inherit the kingdom. That's his, his right hand. And then the one who would counsel him would be to his left. Now, I'm using my right and my left, perhaps in video, re it's reversed to you. But um, Jesus is the right hand for God the Father. The Holy Spirit is the left hand for God the Father. And God the Father sits in the middle, as it were, in the trinity of the being we know as God. And um, this, uh, this great being, the one from whom all things have sprung, uh, all all life that is uh, can only exist because God exists and God is self-existent for no one created him. He's always been here. Now, this is according to his own testimony. This isn't just a, a philosophical um, idea that I'm putting forth to you, nor is it merely a religious point that I'm trying to make. 
God's own testimony is that he's all there's ever been. And he even says of other gods, he says, if there are other gods, I don't know of them. <laughs> so uh, so there's no other gods but him. He has, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So you and I are looking at a context where they're talking about a kingdom. Now, this kingdom that they're talking about is not the throne room of heaven where the Father sits in the middle, the Son to the right hand, and the Holy Spirit to the left, but rather instead this is speaking of the earthly kingdom of Israel where Christ will be on the center throne. Well, they're asking about somebody to his right. Nobody is going to inherit the kingdom from Christ. Okay, so whoever sits on his right hand is not going to sit on his right hand because he's going to inherit, but it would still be in a, an important uh, position if such a position were necessary. And then to the left, who counsels God? God himself says there's no one that counsels him. So hi, Tim, good to see you. And, uh, and so since there's nobody that really needs to counsel God, uh, the, the position to his left hand is is rather uh, is not based upon men's uh, system or the system that that perhaps we might envision God having Himself, but rather instead Christ would be on the center throne, and whoever's to His right or whoever is to His left, that would be for God the Father to decide, because there really is no tradition that can necessitate a right hand man or necessitate a counselor to the left. And so um, this request from uh, Jesus's aunt Salome, uh, Salome, however it's pronounced, um, why this request that his cousins James and John should sit on one hand and the other hand uh, is not a request that Jesus can grant uh, because, the, because even though he is going to be the Lord of the kingdom of Israel, uh, God calls him in the book of Ezekiel calls him the prince, okay? So if God is calling Jesus the prince in Ezekiel, why then there is an indication here that uh, like David of old, who held the kingdom in trust for God, Jesus is going to hold uh, the kingdom of Israel in trust for the Father. So um, this is a, it's an interesting question as to how things are supposed to be structured as time goes on, but yet at the same time, uh, there will be structure and Jesus will sit on the throne, uh, but the 12 apostles will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, and we know this so far. Uh, obviously, there's much more to it with regards to what we see in Revelation 20 and also in 1 Corinthians 6, but um, we'll have to get to that at another time. We've already visited it a few times in this study. So um, continuing on from there, I want us to look at the question three, which is really kind of where we're picking up. Uh, what's Jesus's model for leadership uh, to in the above passages? Okay, so the model of leadership. Now, this is an interesting question because for one thing, uh, Jesus is not, uh, he, he is leading, but he's a follower that is leading, if that makes any sense. The Son, the Bible says, is the exact representation and manifestation of God. And uh, so the Godhead is manifested through the Son. And yet the Son of Man, which is the human uh, makeup of God, the, the human of God, the, the Son of Man being man, and the Son of God being God, um, this Son of Man is himself a servant. Uh, noted uh, in Isaiah 52 and 53 uh, that this is a servant. This is a particular servant. Uh, he's not just any servant. He's a particular servant. But is he a servant of men or is he a servant of God? You see, that's the question. Now, when he says to them, if they want to be great, then then they need to be a, then they need to uh, serve others or minister to others. And if they want to be 
chief. They need to be a slave. Uh, that's the, the, the actual term used there for, as servant, interpreted as servant in the King James. Okay, so, so what Jesus is saying is, you really want to be good, you need to be, first of all, a minister. You want to be fantastic, you need to be a slave. Now, a slave to whom, a slave to what? Well, the Bible says that uh, we need to be a slave to our brothers and a minister to our brothers because Jesus came not to, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus' purpose was to serve. Now, here is where... Here's where interpretation leads us in two different directions, okay? We are at a watershed in this question. The watershed here is that if Jesus came to serve men, then he has lowered himself and men have now become uh, his main focus and that's what he wants to do is make men's lives better. Now, that's one mode of Christianity that probably the most popular mode that you have right now. The biblical definition of what is going on here is found in Hebrews 1.3. He's the exact representation and manifestation of God as the Son of Man the uh, Jesus is obeying the Father. Now, because the Father wants him to help people, people are being helped. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Okay. But if Jesus came to serve people, then he's going to take his uh, he's going to take his instructions from people. He's going to take his uh, his cues from the people. What did you What do you need me to do today? What do you want me to do today? And then he's going to proceed to do what he can to make people happy. Now, again, that is the most popular interpretation of this passage that we see before us. Some have called it servant leadership. That while the whole time that he is leading, he's leading by pretending to be their servant. Now, I say pretending, and why? Because if he's truly their servant, then he's not leading. If he's truly their servant, he is just serving. And so the, the coined term that has been put together is this coined term of servant leadership, that he's leading by serving or that he's leading by showing people how to serve each other. Uh, so that, so that in, in essence, what they're saying by servant leadership is that he is pretending to be a servant so that people will understand that leadership is about good service to others. Now, in some sense of the word, that's not too bad of an idea. I like the idea myself personally. However, this is not what's being dis displayed here before them. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. What does that mean? He came to serve who? He came to serve the Father. He's doing exactly what the Father wants him to do. Now, he's mentioned this in John 10, and he's been rather uh, adamant about it, that he only does what the Father tells him to do. He's not here to serve the people. But by serving God, he serves the people. Um, but the people, they, they get service as a side benefit. Um, now, to give you an idea of what I mean by this, imagine, you know, in, of course, here in America, we have, we have restaurants and perhaps they do other places that may be picking this up. But... Um, when you go into a restaurant and the waitress comes to your table 
and the waitress says to you, hi, I'm your waitress, and I'm going to be helping you today, and uh, would you like anything to drink? Could we start you out with something to drink? And then the waitress says, okay, now uh, would you like to, some more time? Do you want to order? And you say, oh, yeah, I'm ready to order. And so you tell this waitress what to do. And the waitress goes and she gets your drink and then she goes and she gets your food and she brings it back to the table and she stops by every so often. Is there anything else that you need? Now, for that period of time that you're in that restaurant, she's acting as your servant. However, she's not your servant. You don't pay her bill. You don't pay her wages. You may pay your bill, but you don't pay her wages. Okay, ultimately, she serves the manager or the owner of the restaurant. That's really who she serves. You get service as a side benefit to her service to her boss. Okay, now in that context, you can, you can kind of extrapolate what we're saying here. Jesus is not the servant of men. He is the servant of God. Now, men happen to be the mandate of God at this time in history that he should serve God and obey God clear to death on the cross and complete the plan, to complete the, the covenant of salvation to be obedient even though it will mean his shed blood on that cross for the sins of people who by nature, the Bible says, are haters of God. So the scripture then says rightly in Paul's writings that even when we were still enemies of God, Jesus died for us on the cross. While we were yet sinners, while we were still his enemies, he died on the cross. He didn't die on the cross because he had had cut a swath of people out and made them friends. That's right. Jesus is the servant of God and not men. Thank you. Definitely. So, so what we see then is our Savior, Jesus, exercising obedience, Philippians 2 tells us, and humbling himself so that he obeys God and obeys God and obeys God, even though people who hate God nail him to a cross. But this is according to God's plan, because Jesus now can be the head of a new creation. And that new creation we know as the church. Now the church, the word church in the Greek means community. This is the community of Christ. Those of us who have been saved, who have been sanctified, or are being sanctified rather, who have been converted, we're the ones that have been brought into this community by God himself, a holy work. Not a, not a collaboration between men and God, but a holy work, one that God has done on his own. To uh, bring us a little bit more <coughs> to point, You'll remember that in the Old Testament in Genesis 22, that God asked Abram to bring Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah and, and offer him a sacrifice. Now, this is a mystery to many as to why he would do this. And the answer is found in Christ. For Isaiah points to Christ, but Christ then gives us the answer as to why Isaiah had to go to the top of Mount Moriah. Because if Isaiah were to become the head of a holy people, he would have to die for their sins. Now, he couldn't, though, because he was himself not holy. So when he gets to the top of the mountain, God provides a ram. Now, this ram represents Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, then, in representation, uh, gives his blood for Isaac, and Isaac is the one through whom the seed of the holy people of God would be reckoned. So the, the head of the holy seed had to be purified, 
which means that he was not uh, the Messiah or he was not the, the one worthy of being the head of the holy people of God. No, it required the blood of Jesus, God's own son. Now, this in turn meaning the son of man. You cannot nail God to a cross and kill him. Okay, the son of man died for you on the cross and the son of God, that is the spirit, the second person of God, uh, abandoned him on the cross as he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay, now all of this is, has come to be because Jesus came to give himself as a ransom for us. An impossibility for any man, for it says in Psalm 49 and uh, verses 8 and 9 that it is impossible for any man to give his life as a ransom for his brother that he might not see death. Uh, no, no, it's impossible for one man to be a ransom for another man. Yet, this Son of Man, God's perfect creation, a holy man, someone without, without any spot or wrinkle, someone who was possessed by the very Son of God, the second person of the Trinity himself, this man walked sinless. And because he was sinless, he was holy. And because he was holy, he was a righteous offering. And God made him a righteous offering on the cross. Now his obedience and his testimony that he came not to be served but to serve is something that gets confused. And we have one kind of Christianity that runs off in a wild direction like a wild branch off of a vine. And it bears no fruit. It bears no fruit. It just, it, 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 like a weed, it just makes more of itself. It, it doesn't bear any fruit. Uh, that fruit doesn't last. The fruit of humanism is, is, the, is the dust of yesterday. It, it, is, it is no longer uh, lasting. But the fruit of God lasts forever. And it will not die that fruit will always last. And God will always make sure that his church is fruitful. There's two different churches that are represented here in this model. <clears throat> one is the model that says servant leadership. And this one is the one that models great humanism. But it does not model great obedience. The other church is the church of obedience. The church where people obey God and they don't try to control what God is doing and they don't try to make something happen. They just obey God and then they stand back and they watch his wonders like Gideon and his men on the, on the cliff as they stood around and in the dark and blew their horns and pulled out their torches and broke their pitchers and yelled a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. They stood there and they watched as God did something amazing as 135,000 Midianites along with their allies killed each other in the valley. And then they chased the rest of them off and finished the job. Folks, if you obey God, then you will get to see his wonders. If you try to make something happen and control what God is doing, then God will leave it in your hands and it will only be as good as you. I would rather instead, my friends, be an obedient servant of God. So the model that Jesus is trying to give us is not a model of servant leadership, although that is a fantastic model for perpetuating humanism, but rather instead, he is trying to give us the model of an obedient servant to God the Father. So, let's look in Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 to 34 to continue. And as they departed from, Jer from Jericho, a great multitude followed him, and behold, 
two blind men sitting by the, by the wayside when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked him, because they should hold their peace. But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will you have that I shall do unto you? And they said unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Now, there is the actual event, and then there's the the spiritual uh, uh, object lesson that we have here. Okay, first of all, let's talk about the actual miracle and what happened there. Um, there's the same story is told also uh, in uh, Mark 10 and also in Luke 18. Now, some of them say that it's one person. Matthew says there was two blind men. Now, are these the same story? Short answer, yes, they're the same story. Uh, why are they different? Why does Matthew say there was two and others say there was one? Does this get in the way of the inerrancy of the scripture? No, the, the answer to that question is no, it doesn't. Now, here's the reason why. Um, the writers are just merely talking about the ones that spoke up. For instance, okay, um, in Acts chapter 2, the disciples, 120 of them, uh, receive the Holy Spirit. They all walk out and they begin to speak in tongues. And the Bible says that uh, the people said, oh, how is this that we hear uh, the wonders of God in our own tongues? And they begin talking about different countries that they're from and all of that. And then it says, others said, oh, they're just drunk. Okay, now what does this mean? This doesn't mean that a whole bunch of people in unison began saying, how is it that we hear these people in our own tongues? No, that's not what that meant. It means that somebody in the crowd said this and everybody else was nodding their heads like, yeah, yeah, this is really weird. Okay, that's what it means. Uh, it, it's often done in the, in the scriptures that uh, it's, it says uh, the crowd said or the people said or whatever. <clears throat> what it means is a spokesman for the people, everybody being in agreement, a spokesman. Uh, hi, Sherry, good to see you. It, it means that a spokesman is the one that said these things. It doesn't mean that the entire group says this, whatever line it happens to be in whatever passage you happen to be reading. It doesn't mean that they're saying that all in unison. Okay, it means one guy said it and everybody else was nodding in agreement uh, or was going along with it. That's what it means. Now, here, we also have that same problem with Matthew where it comes to uh, the demoniac in the Gadarenes. Okay, because Matthew says there was two guys. The other ones say there was one guy. Why did the others say there was one guy? Because one guy spoke and the other guy didn't. Matthew was there. He saw it with his own eyes. There were two guys but only one guy spoke. And so the others just simply point out the one that spoke. It doesn't mean that Luke and Matthew are in disagreement about this. The actual event did happen. And it's not that Matthew was mistaken. If Matthew was mistaken that there were two, or if Luke was mistaken that there is one, then the scripture is not inerrant. And if the scripture is not inerrant, then you can't trust anything because everything could be a mistake or could just be simply a product of the writer or whatever. This is one of the things that is like one of my pet peeves, okay? Because people will say uh, about Paul and some of his more difficult sayings and some of his more difficult writings. Some people will say, oh, well, Paul was just, he was struggling with this or he was struggling with that or, or Peter, he says something and, and uh, it's offensive to somebody. And so they say, they say, oh, well, you know, Peter was just, he was just Peter, you know, look at the way he's writing. He's writing because that's his personality. 
That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says that the, that the, the word of God is holy and that men wrote it as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean, carried along? That means they didn't even have a foot on the ground. They didn't have any control at all over what they wrote and over what they spoke and said because it was Holy Spirit, not just not just uh, inspired in the sense that the whole, they saw something the Holy Spirit did and they said, oh, this is an inspiration, I'm gonna write my own book. No, what it means Holy Spirit inspired is it means the Holy Spirit was within them and the Holy Spirit drove them and the Holy Spirit wrote through their hand what it was that needed to be wrote and that the, the personality and the person of the man that was involved in the writing wasn't even fully engaged because there was no ability for them to have any uh, real influence at all on what they were writing, for it came from the Holy Spirit. Okay, so so here we're not we're not looking at Matthew. Oh well, he thought this and Luke thought that. No, no. What it is is that there were two guys, but one guy spoke. Both and, spoke in Matthew. And they and they uh, both yeah right Matthew. right. Well, they they say both because because one guy spoke and the other guy went along with it. And that's the point. No, it, it's the same thing in every situation. In every situation, they did not, they, 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 they maybe were talking together, but they were, not, uh, they, they were not speaking in unison any more than groups of people in other places were speaking in unison. And um, th this is why there's no disagreement between Matthew and Luke, because Luke is just simply talking about the one that spoke up. Now, if they happen to both speak, that's fine, but Luke is touching on, on the one that spoke up. And um, anyways, uh, the point being that we have to be careful because we have all kinds of attacks against the scriptures and against the inerrancy of the scriptures. And some of these things have to do with the fact that certain passages appear to be saying something and other passages appear to be contradicting. Um, so if the scripture is inerrant, then there is a point at which they are in agreement. And this is the point in which they're in agreement is that uh, the writer is pointing out the most verbose person, whoever it was, uh, whether, whether the two spoke or the one spoke, the general message, the driving message was, Lord, we want to see. Um, now, that being said, uh, we, uh, we then move on to uh, Luke 19 and verses 1 through 10. So Luke 19 and verses 1 through 10. Do, 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 do. Okay, starting up at verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, whom he, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, uh, 
okay? For so as much uh, he, as he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay, um, fantastic portion of scripture. First of all, who was Zacchaeus? Um, in order to understand a little bit of what was going on here in the time, uh, there were, there were uh, Roman taxes that had to be collected. Now, a tax collector was somebody that was hired by the Roman government, um, but they were hired sort of as a, uh, oh, these days in America, we might say a, a contract uh, worker. And their contract was that they were to collect the tax that was due to the Roman Empire, but they weren't paid to do that. In order for them to get themselves paid, they were to ask for whatever fee they thought was appropriate. And so tax collectors very often would not only collect the tax, but would collect a, an exorbitant fee, sometimes twice the amount of the Roman tax. Now, Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Now, that's significant because the tax collectors that were the frontline guys worked under Zacchaeus. He was, a, he was a, a, a leader. He was a boss of the other tax collectors. And so he would collect from those tax collectors anything that, that he thought was appropriate. And so those tax collectors, knowing that they had to pay the chief tax collector, would raise the amount of tax fee on the people they were collecting taxes from. So Zacchaeus wasn't just one of the frontline guys like Matthew was, but Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, which meant that, that he was extracting a fee for his work because the Romans would not pay them. But they still had to make sure that the taxes were in. And of course, if there was anything that was short, then all the tax collector had to do was just say, well, that's because so-and-so didn't pay their taxes or so-and-so didn't pay their fee. And they could get them in trouble with the Roman government just by that accusation, which is why Zacchaeus says, if I've accused anybody and, and they've been wrong, I'm going to pay them back fourfold because essentially he made them pay twice the tax because somewhere along the line, either he or one of his other tax collectors shorted their accounts. And so um, this is who Zacchaeus was. Um, he wasn't just a, he wasn't just a uh, regular tax collector. He was a boss of the tax collectors. And uh, this made him uh, especially heinous in the eyes of the people. Now, Jesus was walking through Jericho and, and Zacchaeus uh, had to climb up a sycamore just so that he could get a look at Christ. Now, here's the question that I think if we get the right answer, it opens our eyes, okay? If we deliver, if we deliver the common answer, then our eyes remain closed, okay? And what do I mean by this? Um, we don't know how high up in the tree Zacchaeus was. This we don't know. But I believe that the scripture says that he looked up. Jesus looked up and saw Zacchaeus. And um, let's see, when Zacchaeus came to the place, he looked up. Yeah, Jesus looked up. Okay. Which means that in order for Jesus to see Zacchaeus, he had to look up. Now, how did Jesus know that he was going to go to Zacchaeus' house that day? Zacchaeus didn't even know. And so again, if we arrive at the wrong conclusion, our eyes remain closed. Okay, so, so what is the wrong conclusion? The wrong conclusion is that Jesus didn't know, and Zacchaeus didn't know, and somebody tapped Jesus on the shoulder and said, there's a guy up in the tree. And so Jesus looks up in the tree, oh, 
you know, I think I need to tell him about the gospel. So I'm going to invite myself over to his house. However, if we arrive at the correct conclusion, which is that Jesus, being not just the Son of Man, but also the Son of God, knew as God the Father knew from all time that this moment there would be a little man named Zacchaeus up in a tree and knew that it was God's will, the Father's will, for him to go to Zacchaeus' house. So when he walked under the tree knowing Zacchaeus was up, he looked up. And then knowing that he was supposed to go to Zacchaeus' house, he said to Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house today. And then having gone to his house, repentance and re regeneration and all these things began happening. And the definition of a converted person is found in their repentance. A person that is converted repents. Uh, a person that is not converted has remorse. And there's two different things. There's two different things there. Okay, a person that has remorse realizes that their sins have been uncovered and in order to help people to understand that they feel sorry that they, that they have sinned, they show remorse. And they weep and they cry and they ask people to forgive them and they, and they try to make everything right with people. And then when everything is all fine and dandy, they go right back to their sin. Okay, but repentance, when repentance happens, you don't just make things right with people, but you enter into a whole new life. And that whole new life is a life of, of uh, hating sin. Even if you happen to sin from time to time, it's still hating sin. And it's now loving righteousness. Whereas before, you hated righteousness and you loved sin. And this is what has happened here to Zacchaeus. This is why Jesus makes this wonderful declaration. So um, why would Luke think this was important to include, being about the third time this kind of story had been told? Oh, okay. Hi, Kendall. Uh, can't you have both repentance and remorse for your sin? Um, well, yes, I would say yes, but with this caveat, okay, that repentance may include remorse, but remorse does not necessarily include repentance. Uh, sometimes people are remorseful just simply because they realize they've been uncovered and they're naked before other people and they wish to be clothed again, and they're looking for forgiveness from people, and they're looking for pardon from people. And then when they receive that, they may, they may even walk uh, fairly decently for a time, but without repentance, they're just going to go right back to their sin. Or they may adapt a different kind of sin, one that they don't feel is quite as dangerous as the one they had been engaged in. So repentance may include remorse, but remorse does not necessarily include repentance. Um, so if you're first of all remorseful, you're not repentant. If you're first of all repentant, you may be remorseful. I hope that that helps. Um, why would Luke think that this was an important thing to uh, being uh, about the third time this kind of story has been told? Now, uh, with Matthew, same kind of situation. He went to the sinner's house. Um, oh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that it helped, Kendall. Um, so with Matthew, this was the same kind of situation. Uh, Ma he went to Matthew's house. Matthew fed him. They asked, well, why is it that he eats with publicans and sinners and, and all of this kind of thing? And uh, in another place, uh, he goes to a tax collector's house. And they're like, uh, why is it that he does all of this? And he says, you know, it's not the sick that need a, or it's not the the uh, healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. And uh, so here, it's the same kind of situation. And Luke's already told a couple of these stories. And you think, well, why in the world does he think that this is so important? And the key is found in the fact that this was a chief tax collector. And the chief tax collector uh, was somebody that had a lot of influence in the area. 
And so including his story was hugely important because it affected a lot of people. And it was a, it, it was a, kind of that situation where you think, boy, this guy is so evil. This guy is so vile. You know, nothing could ever save him. He could never, ever become a Christian or never, ever become a, a righteous man. And yet he did. And so Luke does include him, but he's the only one that tells the story of Zacchaeus. Um, where are we on time? Okay. We're going to press on. Um, the story of, or the parable of the Minas. Uh, we're probably not going to get all the way through this, but we might. I don't know. It just depends, I guess, on how verbose I get. But uh, let's look at verses 11 through 27. And uh, as they heard these things, he added uh, and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have him, have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to be called into him to whom he had given the money and he might that he might know how much every man had gained by trading then came the first saying lord thy pound hath gained 10 pounds and he said unto him well thou good servant well done good servant because Thou hast been faithful with very little. Thou shalt have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up for an, in a napkin for I feared thee because thou art an austere man thou takest up that thou layest down, not down and reapest that thou didst not sow and he saith unto him out of thine own mouth I will judge thee thou wicked servant My eyes are not focusing well. Uh, thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping what I did not sow. Uh, wherefore, then, gavest thou not my money to the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And he said unto him that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it unto him that hath ten pounds. And they saith unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every man, one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even what he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which thou, which should not, that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. And that's the end of that reading. Okay. Now, we have two parables that are very similar to each other. 
One is the parable of the talents, which we find in Matthew 25. The other is the parable of the minas, which we find in Luke 19. Now, the parable of the minas and the parable of the talents are similar. You have one that gains five, one that gains two, one that hides something and doesn't um, doesn't uh, invest it or do anything with it. In both cases, there's something to be learned regarding the servants. That is, first of all, that they are already servants. Um, these are not people that are candidates for salvation, but these are people that are already servants. And the first two servants in uh, in both of these stories do something with what they've been given. And uh, for argument's sake, they're able to double what it is uh, in the case of the talents, double. In the case of the minas, he invests and gains two more. Uh, they all receive pretty much the same opportunity. But the ones at the bottom, uh, they, they decide that it's too risky. Uh, they don't want to take the risk of, of investing what they have. And so rather than take the risk of losing it, they're just going to bury it and they're just going to give it to him whenever he comes back. Now, we could say that the first two represent obedient servants. Uh, and those obedient servants, according to the, the trust or the calling of the master, uh, the one was endowed with more, and from whom is given more, more is required. From whom is given less, less is required. And the one down at the bottom of the rung that has the only one, first of all, the master already knows that that one servant uh, has very little capacity and very little opportunity and very little ability. Already knows that. That's why he only gives him one. Okay, now that one down at the bottom, though, represents a person who is unwilling to obey because the risk it would take for him to obey, the, the uh, fact that obedience to God uh, could result in him losing whatever he has in this world, even his own life, it is enough to drive him from obedience and to make him careful. And so we have a careful servant and we have other servants that just are obedient. They're not even risk takers. They're not even clever. They're not even people that, that are, that, that, you know, if, there, if it was cleverness, why didn't the one that had two gain five? Why did he only gain two? Uh, why didn't the one who had five, why didn't he gain 20? Uh, he only gained another five. Uh, it, it just had to do with obedience. If it had to do with cleverness or talent or ability or one of these other things that people often misinterpret these particular uh, parables to mean, why then the variant would be, you know, uh, so much bigger or so much less depending on their innate abilities. But they don't do this by their innate ability. They do it by an obedient response to a command. In this particular parable, it's occupy until I come. Now, uh, that's on the servant end of things. On the story end of things, the Matthew story, which we haven't gotten to yet, but the Matthew story is regarding um, is regarding the. Uh, the uh, final um, kingdom, and just as Luke 19 is, um, they're regarding the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which is the, the thousand year reign at the end of the earth age. Now, in the one case, um, Christ, who is the master in the story, Christ is assigning uh, positions over cities in Luke chapter 19. Now this is in keeping with what the scripture says. I'll restore your judges as in days of old. Uh, Isaiah 126. And it's in keeping with uh, the 12 thrones uh, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And 1 Corinthians, we mentioned this earlier in the study, didn't we? 1 Corinthians 6 where uh, it talks about the church 
judging nations and judging angels and and then revelation 20 where it talks about christ's throne surrounded by all kinds of thrones and uh, this new setup this this uh new kingdom order which is an order of of christ surrounded by his judges uh is a different order than regular orders of government uh the only place this order of government ever was used uh was in joshua and judges of the bible and this is the order that god is going to restore someday now the ending of matthew has to do with the servant the ending of luke has to do with the kingdom and as we see in revelation 19 when jesus returns there is a great slaughter of kings and mighty men that try to keep jesus from taking his throne on this earth and jesus slaughters them uh, this is what we see in revelation 19 look it up read it it's uh, pretty gross but um here jesus is the uh, boss as well he's the master the one that received a kingdom and he says, as for those men that didn't want me to rule over them, bring them here and slay them in front of me. I think the NIV says slaughter them in front of me. But uh, this, this is the end of the, of the uh, parable of the minas. The end of the parable of the talents ends with the fate of the one uh, servant at the bottom of the rung. Whereas the servants are giving being given rewards in matthew 25 they're be, they're being given charge of cities in luke 19 so matthew seems to be indicating something more of um of the church whereas luke seems to be indicating something more of the earthly kingdom uh however um luke is certainly uh, got more elements to it than what Matthew does. So these are similar, but not the same. These are similar, but not the same. Uh, so they're, they're not in disagreement over this parable because essentially the parable, although it is similar, the parable is is trying to explain with the same structure two different things. And so therefore... Uh, we are not looking at a disagreement between Luke and Matthew, but we're rather looking at the same structure of, of a parable, but used for two different stories, used for two different purposes. Um, okay, we are at uh, 902. Uh, we'll talk about verse 27 when we get back next week, just briefly, and uh, then we'll... Uh, well, actually, no, we've already said that difference. We'll just simply let you fill in aid as you see fit um, we'll have the uh, next study guide available for you on uh, the facebook page before we get to next thursday okay well it's been great to be with you tonight and i hope that you've gained something from the study and uh, we're going to have a word of prayer and then we're going to say goodbye for now okay let's pray thank you father for your kindness and your generosity in giving us the word of God tonight and in helping us, Lord, to understand it. I, I pray, Father, that in submitting the scripture to its own self, uh, we are not intervening or interfering as human beings in the translation or the understanding of it. But God, if for some reason, because we are flesh, we have entered anything of ourselves into the mixture, Please forgive us and please make that understood to our hearts that we would receive from you exactly what the scripture is trying to say. I pray, Lord, for my friends that are watching, some locally, some uh, around the United States, some around the world. And we ask God your hand upon them, 
that you would guide them and direct them, that they would serve you with obedience and with love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, thank you folks again. Good to see you. And I will see you again next week, okay? We'll talk to you later. God bless.